Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Bogart, manager of Lawrence Technological University's Detroit Center for Design and Technology and founder of Embrace Creatives. I'm thrilled you could attend our live stream event today for Yeah, What Lester Said, an exhibit and panel on sustainability in design. Lester Brown has been called one of the great pioneer environmentalists and one of Marquis's who's who 50 great Americans. Earning his master's degree in agricultural economics from the University of Maryland in 1959, he went on to pioneer the concept of sustainable development. Climate change is no longer an abstract idea that might happen sometime in the distant future. It is upon us now, and its effects can be felt via enormous storms, serious drought, and massive flooding here and in the Midwest. By 1200, by 2100, rising oceans are estimated to force as many as 2 billion residents of coastal areas um, worldwide to migrate towards higher ground and agriculture yields in huge swaths of the Midwest will decline by 50% or more if we don't cut emissions. Collaborating with the American Institute of Architects, Michigan, 2030 districts, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, community leaders, activists, artists, green infrastructure experts, and architects, Lawrence Technological University's Detroit Center for Design and Technology and their curatorial partner, Embrace Creatives, are bringing these absolutely necessary conversations to the forefront before it's too late. The DCDT has put together two and a half months of programming along with an art exhibit, which is currently live on our website, detroit.design backslash Lester. I will add the Facebook link to our comment section, uh, excuse me, the DCDT link to the Facebook comment section. Please visit our page to sign up for all of the events that interest you and enter the art gallery and architecture board exhibit. Everything is free and open to the public. Today's live stream is an extension of our art exhibit. It is an artist talk with moderator and exhibitor Leslie Sobel and artists Stolen, Desiree Duell, and Paul Hickman. Participants will come away with a better understanding of how and why the artists involved make work about climate change and how their work might motivate others to do more in response. To view the exhibit, go to detroit.design backslash Lester exhibit. Also, you want to see Paul Hickman's net zero renovation, detroit.design backslash Rancho Deluxe. I'll get all of these links up in the comments section. Because we are live in social media, you have the incredible opportunity to ask questions and comment. To participate, please type the comments um, below the live stream. The artists will see them and respond at the end of the talk. It's time to begin, so I'd like to introduce you to your moderator, Leslie Sobel. Leslie is the daughter of two scientists, and we are not seeing the video. Sorry about that. This is my first time doing this. I normally don't have, I just have to present. All right. Leslie is the artist daughter of two scientists. The dual perspectives of art and science drive her work. She's a hiker, an activist, and an MFA student at Midlife. Her artwork reflects her commitment to fostering difficult conversations about industrialized society, including complacency towards habitat loss, mass extinction, climate disruption, and the overall negative effects of capitalism. In 2017, she camped on an ice field in the Yukon Territory with a group of glaciologists, and she continues to collaborate with those and other climate scientists. Focusing on the effects of climate change in the high latitudes, her field work in remote places feeds her studio work. She also works with scientists and environmentalists near, uh, near her on Great Lakes issues, as well as the Mississippi watershed. Her BFA is from the University of Michigan, and her upcoming MFA will be from the University of Hartford. She works in mixed media, frequently incorporating photography, scientific data, and painting, printmaking, and sculpture. She has shown widely, including many solo exhibits. She curates ex exhibitions and has been a juror multiple times, gives talks, and works widely to use her artistic practice to increase 
increase climate awareness and activism. Her practice includes working to change how we use urban land, starting with her own garden, where she works to increase pollinator habitat, grow food, and native plants. I'm going to turn this over to Leslie and bow out. Thank you so much, Leslie. Buddy, I'm so glad you can join us and hope that everybody has uh, good connectivity and uh, that we don't have tech problems. Some of the other artists in this exhibition uh, may join us in the chat, including Margaret Parker, Ash Arter, Adnan Sharara, Brenda Miller, Diane Cheklich, and Dominique Chastanet de Gary. I'm going to introduce our three panelists to you and then we'll get started. So starting with Stolen, who is uh, a printmaker, installation, sound and performance artist whose work responds to the urgency of water protection and promotes public awareness of ecological concerns. Um, Sto, are you going to start? Or I guess, uh, Andrea, are you showing his video now? Okay, great. Um, an Asian American artist with equal influences from his Vietnamese and Virginia roots, Len works within this dichotomy by incorporating their unusual bonds with issues of place, identity, history, environment, traditions, and politics. Growing up in Alexandria, Virginia, Stowe was influenced by the art and activism of the Washington DC punk scene in the 90s, which he continues to embody through artwork that combines those ethics with experimental takes on traditional craft. And I think we are ready to switch to introducing Paul Hickman. Paul is an entrepreneurial designer, artist, project production manager, and business owner. Paul has over 35 years of experience designing and creating from billboards to environmental graphics to commercial environments to furniture and picture frames. His designs feature intentionally simple and timeless designs crafted from salvaged woods featuring rich organic textures integrated with raw modern and industrial materials. Including redoing his own amazing home. And Okay, and we will switch now to Desiree. Desiree Duell is an interdisciplinary artist, organizer, and activist based in Flint, Michigan. She has collaborated with numerous organizations across the United States, including Pico National Network, Flint Public Art Project, and Baltimoreans United in Leadership Development. Her work has been featured in Hyperallergic, Michigan Radio, Detroit Art Review, and Art Actopedia. She has received generous support from the National Endowment for the Arts, Aspen Institute, Andy Warhol Foundation, and the Ruth Mott Foundation. And while we are waiting for her video to load, we're having a little bit of network trouble here, but we'll, we'll let that run. And uh, I'll tell you that our format today is going to start with some structured questions and we'll allow time for all of the artists to respond and uh, please type any questions you have in the chat and we will respond to them at the end. So uh, we didn't envision current events when we set out to plan this exhibition and its associated programming. The pandemic has altered people's lives in profound ways. As artists making socially concerned work, all of us have had to change our practices in terms of both making and presenting work. Most of us make work that in normal times requires research out in the world, if not making out in person. So, how has the pandemic altered what and how you make work, Desiree? Um, I actually haven't had that much of a, a difference during the pandemic. Um, as someone who makes work but is also chronically ill, um, the pandemic has actually made things more accessible for me. So I'm able to attend things now online that I wouldn't be able to attend. And, and so it's, in some ways, it's actually made it more accessible. In other ways, of course, you know, I, I live in a food desert and I don't have clean water. So that's also an issue that uh, finding resources is a challenge. Yeah, I mean, 
all the routine stuff has become harder anyway, and you add that to it, and it's definitely a factor. Paul, how has uh, the pandemic altered what you're doing? Oh, it definitely impacts uh, my work. Uh, most of my work, at least currently, is collaborative with uh, some larger entities, some large organizations. I'm currently wrapping, or, or right before COVID hit, um, wrapping up a, a, almost a four-year project with Ford and um where that would have ended probably in late march or april it's going to end next week now so it um it definitely got pushed out and uh blew up the, the final schedule but ultimately everything is is working out fine um so you know mine because it i do a lot of work with other corporations and uh universities and things like that it definitely impacts uh how i'm working but been able to uh, have some time to work on my house. So that was that was nice. Indeed, because I know that's been an ongoing project for years now. Uh, yeah, eight to be specific, uh, nine to be specific. <laughs> wow. Stowe, how about you? How has um, the pandemic affected you? It's, uh, yeah, it's, I feel like it's had a profound effect. Um, you know, and I guess the most, the most obvious was traveling. I was traveling like crazy i mean you know we're in we're in a traveling mfa program and we just got back from miami march 1st yeah i was set to travel again in april and may in june i would be in detroit right now you know so uh i think all of a sudden i had to just sit still <laughs> you know which i think you know all things considered it, it was it was good for me to just like take a moment and um, consider, you know, my home and consider New York City and consider what was happening. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was a stillness for me. There was a, a, a you know, a quiet food that I think um, in some way I, I kind of needed. I was like chasing after myself. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the circumstances were terrible, obviously. And being in New York City was really intense during March, April, and May. And, yeah. And I think, you know, being in the epic center of, of all of that in the country at the time was, um, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, actually, because it is my home. And. You know, I think in hard times like that, you do realize what's important to you and you realize why you are somewhere. And the reasons why I'm in New York became very clear, you know, because I do love people here. I love this city and the way that the way that people responded to that and the way that people responded to the murder of George Floyd was like so inspiring. And, you know, I was like, this is why I'm here. These are my people, you know. Um, so I think like yeah it stops my art stuff it stops i mean i was making work at home but i wasn't traveling and doing the things that i was supposed to do and that's you know disappointing but it's it's sort of um i was able to reprioritize some stuff i think in a nice way so if there's yeah, some positivity as the great pause and i think that's an, an apt way to look at it but i know yeah. you you have a uh, a year long residency in Alexandria. So are you doing that remotely at this point? Yeah, that, that's, you know, it, and it's like, it really stresses your adaptive skills. Uh, and so, yeah, I have a residency at a wastewater treatment facility in Alexandria, Virginia, where I grew up. And a lot of that was about public engagement. A lot of that was about being with people at sites and so I've had to do things on Zoom, you know, um, that I'm still, it's not something I would have ever considered, you know, but it, it still was able to create wonderful moments of making things together and discussions. And I felt like, oh, this is, this is still creating community. It's still like doing the thing, you know, um, that you want to be doing. So uh, it's not as good as being there in person. But um, but that's actually been pretty cool, you know, and, I, and it allowed uh, other people who weren't able to go, you know, physically be there to join. So I think like what Desiree was saying, you know, all of a sudden a lot of people can join the thing. Yeah. 
<laughs> so one of the questions that really comes to mind is how does your work challenge or educate other individuals, businesses, corporations, or the public at large to think about alternative ways to have a direct and positive impact on the environment and or society? And since that question came from Paul, I'll ask him to answer it first. Did I ask that question? Um, I mean, that's where my, my work has gone. Uh, you know, I started out doing more sort of traditional fine art um, and then evolved into doing furniture and themed environments and things like that. Um, and then started my own company, Urban Ashes, about 12 years ago. And through that, I've um, been able to work with some larger corporations and universities to help them start to realize uh, how much impact they have on the planet uh, and everybody's uh, space around them and how they can potentially utilize their materials. My focus has been pretty heavily on utilizing urban salvage wood and deconstructed wood. Uh, in the case of the, like the Ford project that I was mentioning that I'm wrapping up, they cleared 13 acres of property in Allen Park uh, right outside of Detroit for a new facility. And I took two semi loads of those trees uh, instead of you know them heading to the mulch or burn pile where they typically would have gone to. We took uh, those and processed them. They never left more than I think about a hundred miles from the facility process them and, and they're going back in as furniture and you know, three large conference tables that are nine feet by 24 feet. And then also a big, two big wood sculptures that'll be in the entrance. And what I, about the, particularly the wood sculpture and the, and the, the conference tables, it starts creating a conversation. Even when we're doing work on, on the job site, people are asking about, it. I always make it a point to tell them where the wood came from. And as soon as they start thinking about it, it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. And, and, instead of it coming from the other side of the country, or the other side of the world, and how much impact that has. It just it gives a way for people to start thinking about what's right around you in your day-to-day -day life that you can make a change with. And you know, universities and corporations and government, to me, are the three largest entities that have a say or are the caretakers, uh, in theory, of large tracts of land, um, which includes the trees. So I really try to work with them to understand what they can do to divert that that wood in particular is my focus uh, from going into the mulch or burn pile. Wood or a tree um, on average is about 50% carbon. And when that ends up in the mulch pile, give it about two years uh, and that degrades, that's releasing all that carbon. It goes into um, being bi even biochar or firewood. As soon as it's burned, it's releasing all the carbon. But if you turn it into a product that lives and gets passed down ultimately, or you know, maybe passed down through the generations, that carbon, it continues to be sequestered. Uh, so it's another way of realizing what's around us. And instead of creating this um, sort of planned obsolescent world where we're just letting things be disposed of and releasing all that carbon, we can capture it in some really quality things. And it's a lot about education. And they realize it's not that much more difficult to do. Uh, they may not understand initially uh, what resources are around them. So I spend a lot of time actually connecting them with resources and educating them. And then hopefully next time it's not as difficult and they reach out to other entities in their area. And a lot of it ends up tying into local artisans, local craftspeople around them to produce this instead of bringing it from all over the, the country or all over the planet. So that's a big part of what I'm focused on right now. That's why I asked that question. What, yeah, it was nice to ask me, but I'm curious what everybody else is trying to do to get corporations and, and uh, government, as well as um, academia, to think about how they can make a, a real direct positive impact, not just talking about doing studies and things like that. Just what are they physically doing to make an impact on, um, you know, sequestering carbon and, and the, you know, the whole the climate change in general? How can they make a positive impact? So uh, I'm curious to hear what everybody else has to say. Thanks for asking me, Leslie. Absolutely. Desiree, how about you? So I think that uh, I, as far as this work, I think in terms of processes. And so when we're digging in deep, um, I, I ask myself, you know, what is the process? And so extrapolating uh, and Oh, am I mute? Am I mute this whole time? Can you hear me? 
I hear you, but uh, you were showing, uh, now you're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you repeat the question, Leslie? Sure. The question is, how does your work challenge or educate other individuals, businesses, corporations, or the public at large to think about alternative ways to have a direct and positive impact on the environment and or society? Right. So my work is, is rooted in social justice. And so um, my background as a community organizer and an activist um, really came out of um, my own experience um, and, and wanting to uh, seek access to higher ed, uh, which was the challenge. And so um, working, working deeply uh, in anti-gentrification, which, which started um, in Baltimore and then uh, went through rural, rural Wyoming and then back home to Flint, is really looking at these processes, these systems that that perpetuate violence, right? And so when we undo those systems, we undo the violence. So the way that I work is I create systems, right? And and so right now I'm I'm working with a group of artists in Flint called um, the Camp Program, which is a community arts mentorship program. And so after I finished my MFA, really thinking about the way that I wanted to, to be in education and, and what, what the place that I lived in, uh, really, you know, what, what is the culture that, um, that makes this education, right? So um, I really made a very distinct decision not to be in academia because Flint is actually, you know, rooted in uh, the auto industry, manufacturing, skill trades, and um, community arts has always been a community process. So the education and and the and the programming came from the existing culture here, right? And so it's it's retaking these community processes, reclaiming them, and bringing them back to where they started. Um, and so that works in with climate resilience because when we talk about climate change, we're also talking about um, these constructs that that create violence and and whiteness, right? So uh, uh, climate change is a product or a manifestation of colonization and systemic racism and all of these things. So you can't, you can't just talk about climate resilience, right? We have to talk about uh, the resilience of slow violence and, and, and that's these systems that create them. And so instead of, uh, you know, activating these systems, I perform in these systems as research. And then from that research, I create new systems. So that's, that's my approach. Cool. And Stowe? Um, yeah, I think, you know, to Des's point about kind of, I've been thinking a lot about that, you know, with the pandemic and everything and like climate, I mean, you know, climate justice can't happen without racial justice, right? I mean, it's all mm -hmm. like, intertwined and I think I think in my work you know I'm not um, I'm definitely interested in connecting with people uh, I kind of feel like a bit of like I, I try to live a life that's very removed from corporations in general um, but I do what I have been doing recently is kind of uh, looking at the connections you know it's like like you know i go on a lot of boat trips and like walk the shores of waterways and they're polluted and i've been collecting trash you know as, as one does you know, uh decolonizing if you will and then you know you're like what is all this stuff okay so it's a lot of it a lot of it is it's all you know made by humans and then it's all 
you know, it's like styrofoam, you know? And then I started to like do this deep dive project about styrofoam and, and you start tracing it back to corporations, of course, you know, you, you trace it back to Dow chemical, right? In Michigan and like, and then, you know, you, you'd go along the history of, of these things and you're like, oh, wow, you know, like not only have they made styrofoam, but they've also made Agent Orange, you know? They've also made, uh, you know, it, imploding breast implants. You, you know, there, there's like there's like a ridiculous, like you know, <laughs> wrath that they've like uh, you know left behind. And I think it, you know my work is never like overtly kind of pointing the finger at uh, corporations, but I'm starting to find like ways to make those connections visible. You know in kind of like, I don't know, like sort of bizarre poetic connections. Um, but I think for, for me, I, I'm very much interested in like creating mini utopias. I'm interested in creating worlds within worlds to speak about our world. Um, and I think that's how I kind of go at, go at that. You know, it's like we all, there's so many jobs to be done and I think we're all kind of good at different things and I know for me, I, you know, a lot of artists, we just see things a different way, you know, and it's like, like I'm, I'm working at this wastewater treatment facility and the way I talk about the plant, these people who've worked there for 30 years have never thought about it this way before. And that's like really great to just share our insight, you know, and, and so I feel like that's, that's one of the jobs we can do, you know, and that's like, that's something that I try to do in my work. Yeah, one of the things that I'm really struck by is how we all have made choices in the materials we work in, which are really responsive to issues of climate. A lot of us are using recycled materials. A lot of us are using trash or gardens or social practice, different ways to uh, not just make more junk in the world. So uh, I know that uh, Stowe and I and Paul and I have both talked about this uh, offline, Desiree. Uh, when you uh, think about your work in terms of your material choices, uh, is that kind of climate and social justice resilience a factor in what you're choosing to of do? Of course, right. Mm -hmm. so, so all the materiality uh, in my work has to do with metaphor for whatever I'm working with. So the pieces that are in the show that are behind me are actually um, paintings made with flint water, right? And so the studio work for me is actually my understanding my own process. So when, when I look at myself as a process, then I can understand these processes better, right? So like if, if we're thinking of, of consciousness, right? And, and so the, the studio work then becomes a meditation on that, right? And so then what is revealed then spurs the conversation to the public. So I always start private and then I move publicly. And so everything has to do with material and, and, and the issue that I'm working with. All right. So I know you work with uh, trash and printing pollution. So... Clearly, yeah, that, that, I'm this is much about these issues. Water right here, you know. I, I, you know, it's like uh, the the water is a material. It's a collaborator, is how I think about water as well, you know. Um, and yeah, I mean, there, there's a, there's plenty of it to 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 recycle and use for art. Um, but I feel like it's also it's revealing things, you know. It's it's um, shining a light on stuff that people might not normally see and so um you know I, I yeah i did a zoom workshop recently where i had everyone like pull their garbage can and like go through it and, and find stuff and make prints with it you know and and now people are writing me saying i I'm, can't look at my waist the same anymore you know which is great <laughs> but yeah it goes back to seeing things and, and i see I see a, a polluted waterway and I see, you know, the history of, of, it's a tragic history of extraction and colonialism and death and sickness, you know, and, and I want to kind of like 
grab a little of it to, to show people in another way out of context. Um, because all that stuff is so overwhelming, you know, and, and then it, if you're able to kind of give people the an access I mean, point, yeah. Yeah, an access point. I think that's like an important entryway for people who know about it, but it's so hard for people to think about it and to be present with it, you know. Yes, very much so. And of course, what Paul is doing using you know, recycled urban wood is speaks directly to the heart of these issues of materiality. Do you want to expand on that a little, Paul? Well, I mean, this is, Leslie and I were talking about this. You need to unmute. Uh, I thought I was unmuted. Can you not hear me? I can hear you, but uh, it shows you as muted. Um, shows me unmuted on my end, but. Weird. Okay. But I assume people will comment in the chat if they can't hear you. Okay. So hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, this is something I struggle with all the time. Uh, I am definitely a designer slash maker. And I also have very strong opinions on we have too much stuff in the world and, and how much, um, how difficult it is for me to make more stuff. Uh, and the way I deal with that is ideally to utilize materials that are already existing that are not sort of virgin raw materials um, and, or, and or diverting materials that would be headed towards the landfill. Um, and, there, and the occasion when I do need virgin materials, I I make an extreme point to go after uh, materials that are as locally sourced as possible and um, relatively, or when I say sustainable, I mean that they can be replenished pretty quickly. They're, we're not. Um, so in the case of my company, so thinking, you know, how do, you know, I'm starting a company that's manufacturing picture frames. Do we really need more picture frames? Probably not. Um, but we do need jobs for people. And I do want to divert wood from the landfill and, and sequester that carbon. So thinking about every aspect of the company where the glass was made, it was made within uh, almost all the materials for the, the product was made within uh, 200 miles of our facility here in Southeast Michigan. Um, there's uh, virtually no petroleum products in any of it. It's all plant-based, uh, all low VOC and or, um, and you get in this is a whole other conversation about um, non-toxic finishes and, and or low VOC. Um, that's in the whole other conversation, but you know, sustainable finishes that are not coming from petroleum products, things like that. Uh, it becomes, I try to look at, and this is where my education to other people is, just really think about everything that goes into anything that you buy and or are using. Where does it come from? Who made it? What did they get paid? How far did it travel? All of those things. Um, and so I try to think about that as much as possible uh, to deal with you know, trying not to generate more um, stuff that we don't need. Uh, but I also feel that we, you know, we need art and we appreciate really finely crafted things, very you know, finely crafted picture frames are beautiful and hopefully they get handed down for generations. And um, to me, the more thought that goes into them and the more what people realize did go into them, they're going to last longer, but it, it's, you know, it's a battle that I have uh, of there's, to me, it comes down to there's just too much stuff in the world and we don't really need much more. So how do I balance that? And that's a challenge. Yeah, that seems to be a key issue for all of us, I think, because there is this inherent desire and need to make things to express our ideas, but making them beautifully and sustainably is, is crucial. So really all of us are integrating art and activism in some ways uh, and it seems like for most of us those are not separated things they are connected in some way desiree you want to start by talking to us about how you integrate art and activism in your work so um again activism and art have uh, i always believe art are, are the tools of the press so you can't really separate those things so you know, again, it, it came down to, I, I was working in Baltimore and uh, it was like, you know, coming home to Flint in some ways. Uh, and it really just became, you know, what we were doing. You know, I, I, was, I was working uh, in a community in Baltimore and I couldn't have access to get into the to the neighborhood because there was a neglected infrastructure project. So that became the project, right? So it's not, it, 
it, it's not something that's separate, you know, like I'm, I, it's a need, right? And, and so um, that's sort of how my practice has evolved. And then moving back to Flint and the water crisis, you know, it was about my own sickness and, and then generating a project that, that really was about access. So a lot of my work has to do about access to, to activism and protest as well, because not everyone can go protest in the street. You know, that's a very ableist view. Um, and so how do, how do we do activism that's accessible to everyone, right? And, and so that's really what I'm really interested in is, is, is um, being able to, to do this work with as many people and, and, and yeah. So they're not separate, you know, it's my life, <laughs> I, I, you know. It all flows, yeah. Right. Yeah. So Paul, talk about uh, your activism and uh, specifically maybe you can speak to what you're doing with your hiring and your training, because that's, I know, a big factor in what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, so in 2008-ish, well, go back to 2005, um, yeah, I helped start an organization called the Urban Wood Project here because we were ground zero for the Emerald Ash Borer and trying to utilize those trees um, beyond mulch, which is what was happening to pretty much 100% of them. And then jump forward to about 2008, 2009, when I started Urban Ashes, myself and one of the other guys that um, had started the Urban Wood Project got together and wanted to come up with a product that we could scale. And he's actually the one that said, you know, he, he suggested that it should be manufactured with transitional and disabled labor. Um, I could figure out what disabled labor was. I had no idea what transitional labor was. That was the terminology he used at the time. Uh, I thought it was day labor. Uh, and I obviously found out a little more about it. We're talking about returning citizens, folks that have uh, uh, spent time in our mass incarcerated uh, carceral system. Uh, unfortunately, that it, I've the last 12 years is, uh, I, w I don't want to say consume because that sounds like a negative thing, but it's become a massive part of my, um, of everything I do every day. Um, and actually, Leslie, when you asked me specifically about sort of how COVID has changed how I do work, um, I didn't even think about how it shifted what I started doing when everything was shut down. But so I've gotten heavily involved in working with uh, returning citizens that obviously has a huge impact on um, black and brown communities and how privileged myself uh, was as a teenager in particular. Uh, I, I often tell anytime I'm speaking in front of a large crowd, which you know, I, I guess we have a virtual large crowd here that uh, I would say everybody in the room um, with a very small exception or uh, number of exceptions did some pretty stupid things when we were teenagers. Uh, I was uh, me not excluded. And uh, I was lucky enough to get off with uh, basically a slap on the hand. Now make me a, a, an inner city kid in Baltimore, a uh, whole different story. Now you, know, you, you just get shot uh, and it's, it, it's unbelievable what people are going through. And it really opened my eyes to, you know, I, f I started focusing almost specifically on working with people that had felonies in their background and how that, how difficult it is for them to just find a job. And that's been my main focus because I felt like I noticed really quickly that these folks are probably the most discriminated against population in the country. Um, their high majority are, are black and brown individuals and our whole system is built um, to stigmatize them. I'm gonna just tell a quick story here and I'll let it go, Leslie, because this could go on forever. Uh, this is definitely a very passionate thing. I don't know how it, it, it directly in, ties in with my art, but it is kind of what I try to do. Um, I was in a, a, a meeting about two weeks ago. There were four, this was a virtual meeting. There were four individuals in there that had done time in prison. There were three individuals that do a lot of work around uh, re-entry. Re uh, so really understand the language and sort of what, um, how language impacts things. And there were two other individuals that um, are doing incredible work, but one is with the, was with the Michigan Department of Corrections and one was with the Sheriff Department here in our, in our county. And the language differences blew me away, where they consistently 
uh, refer to the same four individuals. And two of those individuals in this group are now high level executive directors of organizations and have been out for quite a long time, but they continue to refer to them as offenders. And, and that's actually the title of Michigan's program is Offenders Success, is their reentry program, which I find incredibly offensive. And if you're going to consistently refer to me as an offender, how do you expect them to succeed? Yeah, boy, words matter, and you're really labeling from the get-go and labeling expectations from the get-go. Correct. So I, you know, I'm I'm about trying to provide opportunities, and if I'm making stuff, um, I, you know, my goal is to get people, and, it, and it's amazing. And this wasn't intentional, but when you know, I started working on with Urban Salvage Wood, and that was at the business, and then my crew that's coming in, and these are people that have kind of been discarded, not kind of, they've been often just literally discarded by society. And they are now working with materials that society also discarded. So they end up having this relationship to the material and say, I'm working on this material to make it a very valuable thing while I'm working on myself, to be turn myself into a valuable thing to society. So it becomes this symbiotic relationship that's pretty amazing. Um, so I guess in that way, uh, it becomes you know tied in with the work and, and giving some people uh, opportunities. It's really all about opportunities and, and whether you provide them or deny them. And unfortunately, we just don't we don't realize how much we're denying people opportunities with, with just the basic language we have that we don't even think that we're being offensive or denigrating to somebody. Uh, it's just so ingrained in our society. It, it is. And I'm getting so sick of the word systemic, but it really is. It's just buried so deep. It, it, it takes a whole thought process change shift to, for, to look at people differently and really pay attention if it's one thing that comes out of this pandemic maybe it's enough pause time for people to be really thinking about some of this stuff uh, george floyd's murder seems to have really been a precipitating event for a lot of these conversations so, so uh so do you want to uh, weigh in on on this in terms of uh, the, the connection between activism and uh, art making in what you do um, sure. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, I also feel like they're just, they go hand in hand. Um, and, you know, I, I grew up in the Washington DC area. So it was like with two social worker parents, you, you know, and, and <clears throat> it was the crack era, you know, it was a crack epidemic. Washington DC was murder capital also of America. And, you know, it's in your backyard. So like, it's, it's almost hard to not be politicized um, when you are living there. And I think it, at an early age, I just kind of saw how it makes a difference to show up. It makes a difference to be in the streets. And also I saw really great examples of how art can be a vessel towards um, justice, you know, and, and even in little ways, but like in really positive ways. So, you know, I remember like putting on, putting on a show and it's like, you know, a benefit for the homeless shelter or whatever, like, and, you know, we made like $70, you know, and like brought it to them. And it was a lot of like change, you know, like coins and stuff, but it's a, you know, it's a beautiful thing to, to learn as a young kid. And also just to like embody as, as you go through life, you know? And so I think any chance I get to do a show or when I created a gallery space it was very much a, a radical space for art and beauty and also for conversation and also for marginalized artists and people of color and and queer artists and you know just a safe space like we need all the good spaces we can get and creating an exhibition i will always want it to be that kind of space for people um and i think recently i've been really interested in just doing away with the white boxes, you know what I mean? Like the commons is the new gallery. It's the new everything. And that's one good thing of, of the pandemic is that everyone's just outside and, you know, we don't need to be in these little boxes anymore. And so that's really liberating. And I think like, um, I've been interested in reclaiming the commons, you know, in, in different ways and, and, um, activating them. So I think that's, that segues actually into questions about site specificity and particularly if we're no longer living in those white boxes uh, how much is site a factor in what you're doing 
is it crucial? How do you see the relationship between a specific place in your work as well as a specific set of circumstances? And so why don't you keep going on that? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, science is huge. You know, I think it was interesting because during the pandemic when we were really under quarantine, my house was my site. You know, I, I was working site specifically at home with the things I've got, you know, without buying things or anything like that. So that was really interesting. And then I think not being able to go to sites felt, I was like, ah, oh, I just, I, I want, I love to go to sites and experientially, a, a, you know, be inspired by them and make work about them. But I think, um, yeah, I've had to adapt my way of working and thinking because that's not, I've been able to do it solo, but you can't really do it with too many people right now, you know? And, and so um, I think that's okay though. Like it, it's okay that I haven't been flying in an airplane a bunch of times this year. That's okay. You know, maybe I don't need to do that as much as I was, you know, like that's like um, part of the problem. But as much as I do really love digging into a site and because every site has so many so much history so much so many ghosts so many things to talk about um and you know i think like with all the monuments getting torn down which is amazing and you know sites and monuments and and new monuments these are all things i'm like super interested in exploring um so you know it'll just be with mass and six feet apart Right, socially distanced, but all these big sites are suddenly getting transformed in very political and pointed and long overdue ways. What do you think, Desiree? How, how does that uh, tie in? Because re really a great deal of the site where you work is where you live, is Flint, right? Correct. So my work is literally down the street. Um, I'm situated in a neighborhood hub, the College Cultural uh, Center. Um, so across the street from me, uh, something that happened during COVID was I got a Dollar General right across the street from my house. And that's very conflicting. But at the same time, you know, um, having a convenience store right across the street from your house is great. But, you know, uh, further down the street is the Pierce Golf Course. And that's my project, uh, Sanctuary Art Park, and, and reclaiming 62 acres of this naturalized, uh, now we believe is uh, uh, maybe a grass, grassland wetlands, and and being able to be to be access that place during this time in the middle of a city where I can go see deer, I can go see fox, I can go see these things, um, and then it's literally a walk away, and then. Um, also, during this time, which was really interesting, is since the, the majority of Flint children don't actually go to school in Flint because of schools of choice, um, which is a product of Betsy. Um, anyway, and, and so now we have all these children home with COVID and they don't know their neighbors, right? And so now these common, this park has become uh, a place and there was a, a Quite a few graffiti that happened on the clubhouse but you know that then that's an opportunity so you know um a local artist nick welch came and made mobile mural boards and so the children can go and express themselves that way and so by by saying site you know it's just being present in a site seeing how people are reacting to the site and and making pointed changes for that expression to happen without without shaming, you know, without all of these things, because um, it's so necessary, especially during this time to have creative expression. And because it, it's completely changing our neighborhood, children are now interacting that would not normally interact, you know. That's an interesting win of uh, school not happening. And it's nice to know there are some. So Paul, you want to come in on the questions of uh, site specificity? Absolutely. Um, I mean, my work has been site specific. Well, it's a combination of site specific, but also 
person specific. Um, so in the case of my furniture in particular, I, I do a lot of what I refer to as, as kind of personalized furniture instead of it just being, or themed furniture kind of, instead of it just being a, a functional piece, it's a piece that um, I like to get to know my clients very well um, and, and kind of incorporate person their their space obviously but also their their personalities into it or their history into it um so i mean that's it's site specific and and then there's you know I, i'm designing often you know four spaces specific spaces so it's it's kind of just literal site specific dealing with you know site specific places and then i try to bring in the culture of the area so in the case of you know i've done uh did a, a a, a conference room recently that was all everything was all Detroit. It's in you know in the Detroit area, but all, um, almost all the materials were salvaged from Detroit and, and sort of um, continuing you know from the Cadillac stamping plant to some you know homes that were um, blighted homes that were coming down and things like that, trying to you know salvage and tell those stories. But also sort of the the personalized specific one. What I mean meant by that is one of my favorite pieces, or probably the favorite piece I've ever done, was a, a client. Uh, came to me, her husband had a rare book collection of American history and uh, Civil War, Revolutionary War um, books. And they had been wanting to come up with a cabinet uh, for those books. And so I started thinking about, you know, what do those represent to him and, um, you know, his prized collection and things like that. But then also um, some sort of imagery that ultimately would represent uh, the books themselves. And so the piece uh, you have to see the picture. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's got some definite, some sort, sort of Civil War um, stylings in it a little bit. But then uh, I came back to her and asked her what her husband's, if he had a favorite battle from the Civil War that he, you know, really had researched and knew about. And it was the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, and so I ended up doing the battle map of Shiloh etched into the glass uh, for the bookcase. It's all etched into it. And this was all a gift to him. So it was very specific to him and to his book collection. So it's very site specific. Mine's a little different than everybody else's, but um, you know that's how I tend to. I try to pull specific things from the individuals, and then maybe their their surroundings, also their connections to the city that they're in. Mm -hmm. like that. So mine may be a little different. Well, your your sites are very specific as a designer for clients. Right. Correct. It, it's driven by those projects a little bit. Right. So. We've now gone through the prepared questions, but we've got some great questions in the chat from our audience. So uh, we'll address those and be a little bit more free form, I think, at this point. So Leslie says, would be interested in your thoughts about environmental racism and the perception that black and Latinx people don't care about the environment in the natural world. So uh, anybody want to jump in on that one? OK, Desiree. Um, so yeah i mean again that's racist you know like that's part of the perpetuating these myths right it's it's that um when you say that you know uh people don't people of color don't care um they do care because they're being oppressed and they're being oppressed in labor forces um that are, are creating the violence right um to say that you know um it, 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 it's part of the violence that exists within envir just to, envir just, environmental justice movements. Sorry, this is like it's a very it's a very it's a very irritating question um, because you know during the water crisis we collectively you know those of us that were organizing on Flint reached out you know but because it was a man-made disaster, it was not considered an environmental issue, which it was because the, the, the processes and the reasons why are very related to creating an economy uh, built on water, right? So yeah, that it, it is environmental justice. Um, and, um, but, the difference is, is that, you know, groups that are rooted in social justice, you can't just separate the environment from systemic racism. The systemic racism is, is causing the environmental damage. So to say that, you know, 
people of color don't care. Of course, you know, like that's that that doesn't that doesn't compute, right? Right. Well, the the woman is asking is a woman of color, and uh, I think in terms of that set of issues, so often people of color are chased out of natural well, yeah, commons yeah, too. So. I mean, it's a it's yeah. a prob it's a problem with environmental justice is the fact that it, you know, largely it has been rooted in whiteness has not included those issues as being the we have not centered those issues as being part of environmental justice. And yeah. I think that that it, that's a problem of the movement, but not of people. Yeah, I, th I think it's a misperception and uh, it, it's it's a distortion, but it's unfortunate because it it's a wedge. Um, either of you guys want to add to that, or should we move on to other questions? I'm happy to add to that. Um, I think again, it's it's very much about, and, and I hear you, Desiree. Is it's it's a it's a frustrating question um, that unfortunately too many people probably believe it, and that's. Um, incredibly angering and, and to me again it's about opportunities you've got a, a very high percentage of people um, that are black that are, haven't had the opportunity to directly engage with an environment beyond their their food wasteland or their concrete jungle that's right around them and they don't get to see like, you know, the the space that you talked about just being created in flint uh, or where you're at and so because they haven't been able to experience that they don't care about it um, I find that it's already been stripped from them, so it doesn't mean you get to abuse it even more. Um, and it, you should be going the other direction and bringing it back and um, al allowing everybody to have the access to the same stuff that we have access to. And and I, <laughs> I am as you said, I am damn positive they care and want to want to uh, preserve what uh, what little you know what we have left. And what we haven't destroyed yet, and try to restore it. So it is incredibly frustrating. And to me, again, it comes back to opportunities. You got so many people that don't, don't even have the opportunity. There was a thing on the radio today um, talking about, and oh, I'm going to mess up her, the comedian. Um, uh, last name is Love. She's from Detroit, also. She was on NPR, and they were talking about um, you know growing up in Detroit, and then once she find that she joined you know, Girl Scouts, even though she grew up in the the, the the Brewster Douglas projects and didn't see anything other than that until she was about nine and she was in the Girl Scouts when they were literally just you know stitching their clothes together. So, I you know, saw that. So get out and camp and that just like you know blew her mind is like wow this is what is really out there and you know, it changed her completely. Um, so again it's about that opportunity. Uh, so I think um, for somebody to say that black and Latin or black and brown um, individuals don't care about the environment is one of the most egregious statements that somebody could say. I think it's highly offensive. Stoke, do you have anything you want to add to this? Uh, I mean, you know, I 100%, 100,000% agree with that. Um, and I feel like, I don't know, I, I mean, like, it's all again, it's just all connected. You know, you, right. you think about, you think about, um, you know, I can't breathe, like this statement, right? And it's like, um, you know, Eric Gardner, who was murdered in Staten Island, also said, I can't breathe. And he also suffered from asthma. You know, that's all like related to bad health, bad food, bad air quality. You know, it's all related to the environment too and related to where your neighborhood is. You know, is it is it near a petrochemical chemi company? Is it near a landfill? You know, these things are like not by chance. It's a system that has created uh, a situation for people to fail, you know, and and, and that that's like, of course, you're going to dump your crap near the, the lower income neighborhood. You know, if you're if that's your system, you know, like that's what you're, you're trying to like actually actually oppress people. And that's oppressing bodies and that's oppressing the land, you know, and and, and the water. So it's completely connected. And I mean, obviously, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that statement's completely false. And I think that, you know, not the people in that situation don't always have the opportunity for the resources or, or the education, you know, and, and that's where people need to step in and, and do something about it. 
or even the safety to go to these places because uh, I, mean, I have friends who are black who say they won't leave their urban setting because of concerns about being hassled. There's a ugly story on Facebook I think we've all seen about a guy hiking in Indiana who with a bunch of yahoos tried to lynch him for hiking. And, uh, Unfortunately, that's in my hometown. Yeah, I know. I, I know. Yeah. I wanted to add something here. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, that when we're talking about surviving and, and we're talking about surviving poverty, um, you know, I didn't care about the environment until the Flint water crisis, right? I mean, I, I grew up in Flint during the 90s, during the crack epidemic. You know, like my family has been personally affected um, by this. And 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 as someone who experienced poverty, you know, you are just surviving. So you're just going towards that next step to that next step, to that next step. And to, and it's not that people don't care about them. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you're living in poverty, you completely have to protect yourself. So the environment, um, then you become desensitized by it, right? So like um, one of the gaslighting, the gaslighting about the water in Flint is that you don't have a connection to where that water is, right? Where is that water coming from? right um and then we realize that like there's no private space because we need public access to make the the private space happen right and and so we're we're colliding with that consciousness right now with covid right you know with the tech and like having kids running around while you're working and all of those things people are experiencing what poverty in a way that you know like everything is happening at the same time and that is that's what poverty does and 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 part of poverty right is systemic racism so that's part of the cheap labor and and an economy based on rape and rape culture right yeah 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 Leslie adds there's also a failure to recognize that low income and people of color are actually more naturally inclined to recycle than high income people because of economic necessity and you know boy howdy is that you know, absolutely true and she responds to you saying maslow's hierarchy of needs and yeah if you know if you're worried about paying your bills and feeding your face uh worrying about the environment feels very separate and a luxurious so and we have a couple other comments that are germane to that. Stephen Allende talks about how Chris Hayes is apparently talking about what I'm assuming is the crack epidemic this week, too. I, I think that's uh, what he meant with auto autocorrect here. But, uh, and Lori Wechter is somebody who, Paul, if you don't know, I should connect you to because she's also doing a lot of prison stuff. Meanwhile, Charles Boltman asks us, question for the speakers, who from the past, artist, maker, etc., do you think about, look to inform your work today? Anybody want to jump in on that? Sure, I can. Um, so I can tell Chuck this you know, response in person since uh, I'm the one. <laughs> yes. Anyways. Um, Mine, I don't know as far as, you know, he throws in in the past. Um, there's a few, there's a lot of artists that I like, but I don't know that there's really any that I, any specific ones that I consciously, uh, and I use that word specifically, consciously um, think in my head, you know, oh, what would they do or what have they done? And I want to model after that. I mean, there's definitely some artists that um, some aspects of their work has been adopted into my work. You know, Asama Noguchi is, is one um, that comes to mind. Uh, Larry Rivers in particular, because um, I'm very much about, I love incomplete process. Um, and uh, for those who know who Larry Rivers was, uh, a very high percentage of his paintings uh, were incomplete compared to, you know, in theory, you know, what they were intentionally incomplete uh, would be more accurate to put it. And going back and looking at Rembrandt, uh, Rembrandt's, uh, or excuse me, not Rembrandt, um, William Turner's uh, pencil drawings of his sketches that are incomplete, I absolutely love. 
But um, uh, more specifically, the two artists that impact me the most are both still alive. I think two of my uh, best friends. One is one of my oldest friends. He's the guy I blame for getting me into the arts. Um, I met him when I was nine years old, and he was a grad student at uh, Indiana University as a printmaker. And um, his his whole... I can't tell you how many times he said to me, he's like, damn it, you're stealing my work or my ideas again. And I'm not even aware of it. Um, and, and, uh, Bill, he's a, um, a artist and picture framer. Imagine that, um, down in, in Cincinnati. And he's, um, does crazy audio pieces. We started, we were doing when we were kids. Um, these mixed, you know, before we had any kind of digital, anything, we were recording tapes and then recording back over the tapes of the tapes and the tapes on top of the tapes. And he, you know, got me interested in looking at all kinds of stuff. So Bill is, is, is still alive. And another gentleman, who was one of the, my very first, um, employers that I worked for a guy named Larry Cornegay. Um, I really, um, adopted a lot of his, I would say design, uh, aesthetics as well as his work ethics. Uh, so. Those are more, you know, Chuck, those are, those are more people alive, not uh, necessarily uh, historical, iconic uh, artists. So I, you know, I think they're both pretty damn good artists in their own right. Unfortunately, not that many people know who they are. Well, maybe now a few more people do. Desiree, how about you? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, beyond basic, you know, art school training. Um, a lot of my work is actually informed by theory. So I, I do a lot of reading. Um, I try not to look at other people's work um, as a practice, just to, to hone my own voice. Um, and, and because, you know, I think that because we, we work in an industry that promotes stealing and cultural appropriation as a practice. Um, I think that it's really important to, to and, and you can't unsee, right? So it's like, you know, how do I create a, a voice and an intuition that's authentic to me, but also partly to my, my family's lineage? So, you know, I, I, I'm, I come from a long line of artists um, and, and so to me, it's like, well, what, what, what medium did my grandma use? <laughs> you know, like what, what is my, what would my grandpa make? What, how would my grandma dance or perform? And so, you know, really um, because a part of deconstructing whiteness is it takes away our roots and our lineage. So like everything that I do is either related to my own family history or narrative in some way. So that's my personal practice. Makes sense. Stow? Um, like in influences, I feel like, um, well, I always talk about this one artist, but we, you know, when I was a kid, I would go see, uh, I would go to the National Gallery of Art in DC and my favorite piece was an installation by an artist named James Hampton. And the installation was created with aluminum foil and it was like kind of uh, majestic, you know, and I would just sit on the floor and I would just really want to see that, you know. Um, and, you know, it turned out, I learned later, he was a janitor, he passed away and someone opened his garage and discovered this amazing installation that he'd been making his whole life, you know. Um, and he made a world for himself in this garage that was incredible. There were hats, there was a throne, you know, he had created a language, he had created, you know, books and, um, and it was his way to communicate to the, to the, you know, the, the galaxies, you know, and, and I, you know, even to this day, I, I realize, oh my God, I'm kind of doing this too. You know, I'm like wanting to like create these languages, um, out of nothing, right? You know, out of recycled materials and out of like just using what what you got, you know. Um, and so that that he's always been a big inspiration in that way. And then I think, you know, more obvious inspirations that I have are like uh, 
the artist Meryl Latham and Eucalys, who was the first and only department of uh, sanitation resident artist in New York City. Um, as I am also a resident artist of a sanitation wastewater treatment facility, I I look to her for some guidance, you know, even though we are pretty different. Um, but, you know, I think about lineage, you know, and I do think about artists who kind of paved the way, you know, and so it's, it's great that she did that. And I feel like, you know, what I'm doing there, part of it is just being like, yeah, artists need to be here. You know, we, we do need to be in these like aspects of civic society too. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know that that's a big one. And then, yeah, I don't know. I'm really influenced by music too and films and stuff. So I kind of, I do like to look at other art that's not like mine. You know how people are like, oh my God, this looks just like so-and-so. You should check out their work. And you're like, no, 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 no. No, I don't want to look at something that's just like my work, you know? <laughs> I want to listen to like free jazz and like, I don't know, you know, look at something that's totally different, but that I can relate to in other ways. So. Yeah, you grow more seeing stuff that's uh, different than uh, seeing things that are similar. So I'm going to invite the audience. Do you have any more questions for us? Uh, and artists, do you have anything more that you'd like to share? And suddenly we have a resounding silence. While we're waiting, I will add that one of the artists that I've always uh, been influenced by uh, is Joseph Cornell. And people who know all the little boxes and shrines I make can obviously see what they are, but where his his work was very interior and personal with it, uh, I use that format to make work that's more environmentally focused. And, uh, so yeah, it's definitely one of those, there's a medium, but can do something quite different with it. And uh, okay, textures, you got anything more for us? Scroll back up and see if I missed anything. Meanwhile, anyone uh, care to chime in with uh, any other thoughts about this project, about making art in response to climate and COVID? I'm glad we got to do this, Leslie. Thanks for yeah. curating. And uh, yeah, I was really looking forward to being in Detroit. I hope to go in the not so distant future. Yeah, hopefully we can make something happen once COVID is over so we can all come together physically. Because this is, virtuality has its merits, but it, it feels like a pale substitute of the real thing at times. Desiree, Paul, either of you want to weigh in? Just thank you very much for having us. And, and Andrea also, who's off screen at the moment uh, for coordinating all this and and running things behind the scenes. Yes, exactly. We'll get a little round of applause, but thank you, uh, Leslie. And it was good to meet everybody. And uh, again, thanks. Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today.